As I discussed in the video I have now taken down, uh, and in the other video, as I mentioned briefly, one of the things that prompted me to do this was the idea of taking risks. Obviously these are not major risks, but from the perspective of someone who is admittedly a little bit on the shy side and who does not want to negatively impact other people's lives, it does strike me as a risk to come out here and say, hey, I want to talk about blah, and, and, and having no idea what people are going to react to on that. <sighs> but the encouragement of several individuals who commented on the video before I took it down, and of uh, some family members, I have decided to go ahead and put this out. For the last couple of days, a story has more or less been forming in my mind. I almost say on its own. You know, I started with a base concept, which I found interesting as I was going to sleep one night, and as so often happens, because I tend to design settings rather than stories, if that makes any sense, the story evolved naturally because I knew what would happen next. It, does that make any sense? That's what I tend to do. I, I have often said and been told that I'm a good world builder, that I'm a good setting builder, that I'm a good, you know, I, I can make a, a concept like that. But one of my flaws, of course, is the fact that I'm not a good writer. Um, although some people would argue that. <laughs> but, you know, it's very difficult for me to write. It's, it's, it's true. I have such difficulty sitting down and writing things out. I have such problems actually, you know, I, I can picture a scene, and I'm sure most people have this problem. I, I can picture a scene, and I can picture how it should go, and the directing, and the angle, and the, the intent, and the tone. But actually sitting down and saying, there was this over there, and that over there, and then this guy said that. I always feel like I'm taking something away from it, and I always feel like I'm doing it poorly. So, whether I am or not, I have no idea. I, I can't accurately judge my own work, but you get the point, right? So I wanted to get this story idea out there somewhere in some ma manner, and as I just mentioned in the, uh, my last video, this is effectively the same motivation that led me to talk about my Mass Effect 3 alternative idea, was because I wanted to get it out there somewhere. Um, I don't expect a similar explosion over this, but it is still a risk in my mind, and so I, it took some prompting for me to finally get down here and say, okay, I'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> no, I have to actually start, don't I? Picture a world that is more or less identical to this one, right? You know, very real, very uh, down-to-earth, laws of physics, politics, money, all those boring things that are generally disinteresting, right? And in this setting, an individual appears. Now, this individual... I can picture him mentally. He's he's clad completely in armor. He's huge. He's he's almost giant level. At least, I'd say uh, eight or nine feet tall. Completely clad in armor. You can't even see his face beneath the mask. And he has this massive sword that can transform into an axe or a whip or a spear or multiple swords. And yes, I am basically describing. Uh, many of the aesthetics of Garland from Dissidia. I, I should probably give that that, that, that blue point first, or the, the blue point, wow. That uh, bullet point first, because I did in the other video. This is a f what I would go ahead and r r acquiesce to being called a fanfic, because ultimately what I'm doing is taking my interpretation of concepts from other works and placing them in into this specific setting. So as you will find out as I start to discuss this in brief, all of the primes for which the story is named are modeled in after my interpretation of the representation of the main Final Fantasy villains within Dissidia Duodecim. <laughs> Got all that. <laughs> and so the first, which is what he calls himself, is effectively, uh, for all intents and purposes, we'll call him a mutant in X-Men terms, for any of you who's familiar with Marvel or X-Men or anything like that. He is someone who has more or less spontaneously manifested uh, special powers, right? He has become a cape. I call this term enlightened for reasons that I, I will eventually reveal. Now, I don't want to spoil too much in case I ever actually do tell this story, uh, because one of the things I really enjoy about a story is not spoiling it, um, especially when I'm telling it. But suffice it to say, uh, there are reasons for most of the things that I am going to mention to you here. So if something doesn't make sense, there's probably a reason for it. That being said, I am going to say one thing. He is not called the first because he was the first enlightened. Just getting that out of the way. So the first, the way this story begins is, is it focuses on the first's perspective. And he enters the United Nations, which is in session at the moment. And he holds them hostage. Now... The the point of him holding them hostage is not to gain any particular value or merit. He he doesn't make any demands, in other words. 
what he does is does this to provoke people. And so the people send, you know, the police try to storm the building and go after this guy in armor. I mean, come on. He destroys them completely, utterly. You know, and then they start sending in SWAT teams, and then they start sending in FBI and all this fun stuff. I actually misspoke earlier. This actually occurs in New York, obviously, you know, nation's building. Uh, but the story proper is actually primarily set in Europe, uh, primarily focused in Germany. But anyways, moving on. He walks in here, and he does this, and he demolishes everything they send after them until it reaches the point where they are sending gunships from the military, and uh, it actually, f they find it risk-worthy to launch a cruise missile at him, uh, which does nothing. Th th that's kind of the point. When, they f when that attempt fails, there's a pause, as, as the military doesn't know what else to try other than trying nuclear fire, which obviously they're very hesitant to do in the, in the United Nations building. Now, keep in mind, A, he has had no contact with the outside world. You know, he hasn't made anything. B, he has made no demands, obviously. And C, he has done nothing to harm the hostages. So he then goes back in and, and makes contact with the rest of the, the, the governments and the personnel who are willing to listen to him. And he says very simply and very plainly, have you gotten the point yet? And the entire point of this exercise was to get across... There you go. Was to get across that they can't stop him, that he is simply beyond them, that he is simply too much for them to handle with their minuscule and mundane ways, and that's how he puts it. And, it, you know, the person he's done talking with, who I believe was actually the president, or maybe it was the secretary of defense, it was the secretary of defense, um, is, is, is saying, you know, you went through all this just to say that, why didn't you just say that? And, and the first says rather reasonably that you would not have listened. If I just walked up to you and said, you can't stop me, then you would have just laughed at me or, or seen me insane or tried to haul me out, and then this would have not gone as well. I needed you to understand this first building block. Because, see, the thing you have to understand about the first, if I might pull back from the narrative for a moment, is that his mindset is very blunt and very brutal. He wants the straightest line from point A to point B. And so his goal, when, when he starts to take country's hostage, starts to force governments to obey him and, and pledge loyalty to him, this was his lo most logical starting point from his perspective, was to get in a very public place that's going to have a lot of coverage from across the world and show unequivocally and without doubt that you can't stop him because he's simply that much stronger than any of them. Now, I want to diverge for a second because one of the things that's part of this, as indeed inspired by uh, Dissidia to a large extent, is the way he fights because his power is all expressed more or less through physical strength, through that weapon he has, but he also has the ability to imbue himself with the four elements, you know, fire, earth, water, and wind. And he uses this to great effect in order to uh, take down anything and everything that comes after him because people don't give up, of course, but it. About at this time, a young individual who I have decided uh, in the intervening time from the previous video to this one to call Sidolphus, a young individual, uh, I don't even remember what that name's from, actually. I think that's FF13. I don't remember. Because uh, I, th uh, I actually originally got it from something else, and someone pointed out, isn't that the name of Sid in FF13? Whatever, I like the name. So Sidolphus, with an S, by the way. Sidolphus... Uh, is a young man who is an ex-soldier who happens to manifest, as I like to call it, and becomes an enlightened. He gains increased durability, uh, increased agility, increased strength, increased speed, and increased reflexes, but the biggest and most important thing he gains is durability. He is extremely resistant to damage, and he gains the ability to project this uh, energy, hard light shield, on, um, on him, which is effectively a manifestation of himself, and he can use that offensively and defensively. And so he spends the next year or so training because he puts two and two together and realizes that this individual, the first, as he calls himself, is like him, is a similar circumstance. And since there have been no news reports, no information, no anything about anyone else manifesting in this matter, he feels that it is his responsibility as a soldier to, t to take up arms and do this. So he trains with his powers, gets used to it, gets stronger, and reaches a point where he feels he can contest the first, because he, he, he feels like he only has one shot at this, and, and logically so, and he doesn't want to waste it. So he goes after the first, and I'll skip ahead a little bit, he loses. The first doesn't have an easy time with him, but he does defeat him. Now, the first, this whole time, it's relevant to know, has been having this very monotone tone. You know, he's just been, you're irrelevant, move aside, you do this, you follow me. 
when he's fighting with Sidolphus, he actually has emotion in his voice for the first time and enjoyment. And when he defeats Sidolphus, he's laughing. He, and I don't mean, you know, monocle. <laughs> No, he's laughing. He's he's exuberant, and the reason is because, and as he tells this to Sidolphus, you know, I I have been waiting this whole time for someone for anything to present something more than ju than just a, a bump in the road, <laughs> more than a speed bump for me to have to slow down slightly. For you are the first thing that has actually made me have to stretch since I have gotten here, and. He, Sidolphus is, is just looking at him, you know, bitterly because he feels like he's lost, obviously. And he's waiting for the first to kill him, and the first doesn't. The first, and, and, and Sidolphus actually has this line, which is something along the lines of, What, what are you, stupid? <laughs> You're just going to let me go so I can come back and challenge you later? Is, is the, are you following the villain's what-not-to-do list or something? And, and uh, the first response is, that is exactly what I'm going to do, because that is exactly what I want. I want you to go and get stronger. I want to have that contest, that challenge of fighting you, of fighting someone, anyone who can actually be... And there's got to be more. There have to be more like us, more enlightened. He's the first one who says the word, more enlightened. There have to be more in this world. You have to find them, you have to join them, you have to train them, and you have to come back and, def and, and give me something real, something to actually enjoy in my life, rather than just stepping on ants. That's what I really want. The conquest is in, is enough of a diversion to keep me entertained for now. But what I really want is to challenge myself against something that is worth my time. And these people aren't. <laughs> so he lets Sidolphus go. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Uh, in my mind, the story has continued going up until the point at which the fourth has manifested. Um... There's a few ground rules for the setting as a whole. Only one of the primes, which is what the first, second, third, fourth are, uh, only one of them can be rounded at any given point in time, and with one exception, all of them are basically equal in power level. Uh, around the time of the third, an organization amongst the humans called the Human Supremacy League, or HSL for short, fires up and... Uh, starts to to do exactly what you'd imagine they do. They are very anti-enlightened in general, not just against the primes. And they develop technology to actually detect enlightened energies and to rate them, and thus we have a rating system that shows up. I only mention this because, you know, there's alpha, beta, delta, blah, 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 and then at the very end of the scale is omega, which is a level they've only ever seen from primes. All the primes are at omega level, and they're all equal, exactly equal, in terms of energy output because all of the primes are basically identical in terms of overall power. It just manifests differently with each of them. And they all have different personalities, different drives. Excuse me. Different interests that keep them going forward. Obviously, I have described the first interest pretty simplistically, and indeed, as is suitable for someone who is so blunt, so brutal, it, it makes sense for his desires to be similarly both blunt and brutal. On top of that, it also sets the stage for the rest of the thing, because you have to see, in my opinion, from a writing perspective, from a creative to work to perspective, for when I'm doing something like this, something that is designed to be an arc, a lengthy arc at that, or indeed multiple arcs, it is best to start with the Stark, S-T-A-R-K, it is, and I don't mean the guy with the mask on his face, um, it's best to start with the most Stark outlook possible in order to show in contrast, everything else. I talked about this in Dragon Age Origins, although to a d they used that to a different extent because they just had one thing that was always a backdrop. But that's the same general concept from a creative writing perspective of what I'm talking about. The first is very simple, very black, uh, more or less. He's not uh, Whether or not he's evil is a matter of perspective. I would not qualify him as completely evil or very evil. He's certainly not a good guy, obviously, since he kills hundreds in his task to make people listen to him. But... The point is that he is not in it to hurt. He is not in it to be cruel. He is in it to to contest himself against those that are that, that, that are very least capable of standing against him, which humans obviously are not, at least in his era. Um, and obviously that changes over the course of the story as humans adapt, as people adapt, as countries start to unite and stuff happens. But point being, and I'm not going to get... There's a whole political backdrop to this too, which is something else that I'm going to do, but with the first as that stark beginning, I can then show every subsequent prime with more and more shades of gray until... and, 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 and it, it evolves, I guess is the word I'm using, Corey. We see characters of increasing depth and perspective and complexity 
But it all had to start, in my opinion, with something like that, or or else the whole thing would have had a completely different beginning. It's also, uh, there's also a good degree of political background going on. I happen to be very good at designing that sort of setting, as uh, most people can tell you from who've been in my D&D campaigns. <laughs> um, but I'm very good at, at designing political situations and uh, diplomatic situations and, and situations of war, and so that also presides a backdrop and is more or less, for lack of a better way to call it, the story of the humans and how they're interacting with and developing in, in relation to this new threat and this new way of life, because as, as, as I've intimated, more and more people become enlightened as time goes on. And these are just people, you know, not, uh, randomly selected people. Obviously, the primes remain ca constant, but everyone else is just, you know, you know. And that has a great impact on society as a whole in many ways. And this is not a whole, you know, Newton Registration Act type of thing. Uh, I, I would like to think that my story is going for something a little more realistic than that. <sighs> but let's not get into that. Let's, let's, let's leave that completely out of this. Let's totally not get into that. Because I don't want to speak ill of that storylines. <laughs> Those storylines. And there's also uh, another interesting thing, and I didn't even realize this until today. While there is what I have been referring to as the heroes, uh, led by Sidolphus, he, he, he recruits several other, other individuals as he goes on. Ultimately, this is the story of the Primes, which is why they, their name is in the title, and why most of the action follows them and what they're doing. It isn't until, uh, you know, during the Second's reign, for lack of a better way to call it, most of the attention is focused on, every, on on the heroes because it felt like a good opposite to the first, and it and it really emphasizes the events that happened during the second's reign. So when they finally confront him, they start to realize that things are a little more complicated than they thought. And then the third doesn't even reveal herself for quite some time, and, and so forth and so on. Anyways, this is just kind of how it's been going in my head. It's been evolving bit by bit, and I kind of wanted to get it out there. And... Uh, kind of see what people thought. So feel free to leave me comments. Tell me how horrible my ideas are. I don't mind. I hear that every day in my own head. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I, I feel like I, I want to get this story out there in some manner or fashion, and I just don't think I can write it, if that makes any sense. Now, one person has already commented on the previous video before I tore it down that I should just do a video series narrating the story. And that's actually not a bad idea. I like that idea, so I, I offer that for thoughts for you guys. But anyways, I have now taken my risk, and you may mock me as you wish. Um, I am going to go back to working on stuff and thinking about the FF10 review. So, I will talk to you all later.